güzel. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Connor Black. Um, I work in the Arab Technology Department. Uh, I've recently just moved there from uh, spending a few years as a facade engineer. Um, I now specialize in making digital bespoke tools for Arab um, using computation. Grasshopper very much comes into that, uh, but we use other tools as well as engineers, such as real time engines and things. Um, so today I've been given the task of talking about advanced data trees. Uh, I understand that you have gone through data trees, you're aware of what they are. Um, have you gone through anything about lists of lists, or has it mainly been lists? Anyone want to respond? Any lists of lists? Anyone heard that? Hands up. Cool, okay. Okay, good, good, good. Okay, great. So we've heard about data trees a bit, but not quite done anything with them. So um, I think what we're going to do today as our task is um, do some panelization. So we're going to take um, a, a complex uh, geometry and nerve surface and we're going to panelize it um, uh, like so. We're going to uh, make sure we have a few things that we're actually interested in. Example, straight edges, the nodes, the lengths of the edges, how many panels. Um, and we're going to make it parametric, which means that we can place it onto any complex surface or adjust accordingly, instantaneously, as well as having parameters to instantaneously play with. Um, so these kind of um, for this kind of panelization happens a lot in national application. For example, this is a project that was working on Lucille by the architect Zaha Hadid. And you can see the shading system here uh, has an underlying logic to it uh, that's been applied to a complex surface. And that's kind of allowed them to iterate the actual design, look at the parameters, uh, analyze it for other things such as daylight, etc., and adjust very quickly. Um, other projects uh, where real <laughs> complexity in geometry uh, is applied. This is a project that was recently done in the north of England with that, uh, by Arab, where we've actually panelized. This is a restaurant, it's a future mission style restaurant. Glass domes, and we were looking at the optimal way of panelizing. Um, we were intersecting spheres, which you know, brings about the complexity in itself just from a geometric level, uh, let alone structural. So um, I'm going to start by talking about data trees. So data trees is the terminology used within the grasshopper paradigm basically to talk about multi-dimensional lists, i.e. instead of having a flat list, you've got a big long list, you've got a list of lists. So it really is that simple. Um, and what that means, if you are familiar with coding, it's actually mo uh, 2D arrays. So imagine a list is one, uh, a one-dimensional array. A list of lists is like a two-dimensional array. Who cares? Good question. Well, what this means is that you get um, a way of manipulating and interrogating the data slightly more co uh, complex to that of a simple flat list. Um, and of course, it can be a list of lists. It can also be a list of lists of lists. And then, you know, an n number of lists of lists. Um, so the analogy, I think, that Grasshopper and the guys that write it are kind of looking at is that it's a bit like physically a tree. You've got lists of lists of lists of lists. That's the kind of analogy you're looking at there. Um, and you'll start, if you actually look at this image specifically, you'll start to see the um, terminology used and the symbology used. So you'll, when you have one flat list in Grasshopper, you might see a number in the top right that just is a number. Then when you have a list of lists, you might have two numbers that are yeah, showing the index. So this is showing a list zero, list of list two, it's this branches. So getting your head around this kind of terminology uh, is one big step that we'll, we'll, we'll go through. Um, so just to show you physically what it looks like in Grasshopper, this is a flat list. And this is the corresponding tree, data tree visualization. So in the top right hand corner, that shows you the index of, of, the, of the list. 
So it's one long and it's the zero list. Okay, so we only have one list, the zeroth one. And then these are all the values within it. So what can we do with that? We could, for example, say um, x plus I mean, all the values in this list, uh, 2, and it give you the answer. Um, and then you'd get all these values added by 2, for example. Now this is where we start to get a data tree. What we have here in the top right is the same again. We have that index. We're now we've got zero and now first. And each one has a list in itself. So you can imagine the visualization doing something like that. And of course, this is can be n-dimensional. So we could really go to town with the complexity at which we store our data. Okay, so as I was going saying before, and what we're going to try uh, and tackle today is something like this, where we're given, let's say, by the architect a complex roof surface, and our job is to rationalize it, interrogate it, and create some form of underlying structure uh, in a rational manner. So we're going to try and create something like this. So when usually one is creating a grasshopper script, first place you kind of start with actually is the sort of pen and paper. Break down specifically what you want to parameterize, what you want to automate, and then what you want to visualize at the end. So to kind of give you the brief, what we're looking at in terms of parameterization is um, the number of bays going in the width and the number of bays going in the length. That's a pretty obvious parameter that one might want to uh, instigate. The size of the node at which all these joints connect. For example, it might be such that these nodes need to be rather larger, taking different loads. And each element has to be straight. So we've got a complex form, but we want all our elements straight elements. Structure, etc., makes this a lot easier. Uh, and then the final thing is that, from a geometrical perspective, we want all these elements normal to the surface at which it is located. We want to understand what I mean by that. What I mean by that is the, no the, the normal at say this point in the surface is pointing. This element is orientated as such. So those are all the things we're going to try and tackle. Um, what we're going to do is, look, because we're really looking at uh, advanced data trees, we're going to do it in a long-winded way. You know, there are quicker ways, but to get your head around what we're going to do, we're going to do a bit of data manipulation within Grasshopper. Um, so I think without further ado, I think let's get Grasshopper open. Um, and for the sake of today and for the sake of simplicity, I think we're just going to make a surface that has four edges. And we're going to, you know, so basically, as you can imagine, a, a almost rectilinear. Um, so let's just create our um, imaginary surface. What I'm going to do is use um, interpolate points. So I'm going to create a NURBS curve. I'm going to create four NURBS curves. So you can follow along if you're you know, well adept at this. What I'm going to do is look in plan. I'm going to draw a funky curve. Put it at right angles, copy and paste it. Actually, So just to go through what I did there, I used, I drew a uh, NURBS curve with the interpolate points or whatever you prefer, the control point curve. Then when I clicked on it, I had the gumball on as it's called and I dragged my green rotation gumball just to get it vertically. So I have two curves side by side. I copy and pasted 
and translated the one in one of the axes. Okay, uh, this is a sort of nominal surface, so don't worry too much about you know artis artistic ability. Simply just a couple of curves uh, adjacent to each other, and I'm going to use a, a function in here to create my surface called loft. I'm going to loft between these two curves, and all that does is create an interpolated surface between these two curves. Just a very quick way to create a NURB surface. So what I do, you can find loft, or you could type L O F T. It asks me in the console, select curves to loft. I select curve A, curve B, press enter or space or click. Um, and I'm just gonna keep with the default settings in actually how that's constructed. If it is wireframe looking, if you press the middle uh, mouse key go to the top right hand side, you should see a shaded sphere. Click that just to give a shaded visual. So this is our imaginary surface, our nominal surface that's been given to us. Um, so let's start with our script. So I'm going to open up Grasshopper. And the first thing I'm going to want to do is instance that surface into Grasshopper. So I want to get an instance of that. I want to sort of, it's almost like a copy, a digital copy, say. Within to the into the Grasshopper interface. So, which node would I use to get an instance of this surface in Grasshopper? That was right. Whoever you said that surface, yeah. So, I'm going to double click and type surface in my Grasshopper environment, and. Once I've got this node, like a variable, I'm going to right click on this and set one surface.
once I've clicked set one surface, I go back into the Rhino environment and select my surface. Now that has, now our surface in Rhino has been instanced into Grasshopper for us to start to manipulate and get the information from that surface from. Not interested really in the surface being visualized much to start off with. So instead of being this light gray, which means that it, I've got this red visualization, I'm going to right click and just untick preview. So I know I've got my surface in there. I don't need to see it for the sake of what we're going to do. I presume you've been told about or made aware about the U domain within the actual surface. So this surface has a coordinate system that's two-dimensional with a U and V coordinates. So I can give a U coordinate and a V coordinate surface equation and what will return is a point on that surface. Um, what we're going to do is use though to divide up our surface initially. So what I'm talking about is the divide surface pane within Grasshopper. So within surface tab, right at the end of the utilities, you'll find the divide surface panel. And what this takes as an input is a nerve surface and then a U and V dividers. This is actually the number of segments you want divided in the U and V. So this is the, the way in which we're going to start off panelizing our surface. We're going to divide up our surface into the U and Vs to get that grid of points that we can use. So the first thing we do, obviously, it asks as an input S, a surface, That'll be our surface, so we input a surface. Default values a lot of the time are given in Grasshopper. So once you do that, you have an array of points populated on your surface already. And that's because the U and V have a default value inserted, which is probably 10, yeah, and 10. So your surface should have a load of points, 10 to the, on the width, divided the width of 10. start to see why data trees and affecting lists of lists might start to become quite useful because we don't have a list of points per se here, we have a grid of points. So we might want to interrogate per row or per column. So one of our parameters that we sort of laid out at the start was, was number of uh, panels in the width and the length. So we can actually control that with say a slider in the U and V inputs. So I'm sh half of you are already there, but if you were to generate two sliders, this slider is probably going to be an integer because you're, it's a dividing. You're not going to divide uh, these points 1.5, say. So I'm going to go from, say, 1 to 15. So I've created a, an integer slider there 
between the values of 1 and 15, let's say. And I'm going to copy and paste that, or redo one, for my v variable as well. And insert those into my u and v. So now I can parametrically control the amount at which my surface is divided. So let's actually visualize um, how these points have been placed into this list. So what we're getting here is we're inputting a surface, but what we're outputting under P, if you were to hover over P or create a panel and insert that into P, you'll see we haven't created a list. We've, what Grasshopper is spitting out is a list of lists. And this is a list of lists of points. Looking at, the t looking at this panel that I've got on the screen, how many dimensions has it spat out with the data instruction? Three. Yes, correct. That's actually a bit not what we want it in. If, you would, if one was to scroll down, looking at each of those numbers, you would see this first value never changes. The other two do. That's because there's nothing in it. So as I understand, it's a form of uh, bug. Um, but basically, there's nothing in it, and it's created by accident. The way to get around that, if we right click on our P, is a little term here, simplify. If you click that, what it does is it gets rid of any um, unnecessary data. And you'll see it's gone back to what we need. So now we've just got a list of lists. If that didn't quite make sense, what I'm going to do is if you were to double click and type point list, or you could find it in the display settings under vector. If you plug that P into our P, if you don't see anything, that means the S, the size of the text is quite small, so type in, say, uh, depending on your units, I'll try five here. Oh, that's far too big, so we're in meters, I think. One. This is actually showing you the indexes of each point on that list. So once I've simplified, can you now see that we have, in my version, a list of 13 points here, then another list of 13 points here, and then another list of 13 points, and another list of 13 points. I have exactly one, two, three, four, five, six of them. You might have a different number of those according to what you've input into your parameters. Everyone happy so far? Okay, we've got our grid of points, we now want to create our panels. These panels are going to be straight edged uh, and they're going to be rectilinear. So how would one create our, our points? How would 
we get a list of our points and then a list of our points where it's all being moved, so this one is the next so a sort of list function tied to that that we could get that. Shift list, okay, perfect, great. So we could take our list of 12 points, there's one less, then we could perform the shift list function, there's our second list, and then we could use the line panel and just draw a line between the two. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's the easy bit, we all understand that. Where we're basically, what we're doing there is drawing a line from 0 and 1, and then 1 to 2, and then 2 to 3, 3 to 4, 4 to 5. And in this case, what would happen is 0 and 1 are drawn, 1 to 2, 1 to 3. So that's the easy bit. That's sort of, you're kind of dealing in one dimension there. Now let's start to deal the other way. We want to join a, uh, a line from here to here. We're not going to really um, shift uh, the actual list per se. Path. So that's the terminology used in the grasshopper. That these are paths of the tree, and what we're going to do is we're we're not going to shift the list. We're going to shift the path along the line. So what we could do is if we grab. So this one brought to that one. That one brought to this one. This one brought to that one. That concept. Resonate. Does that make sense? So this is where data trees actually come into their own. That's where they become quite useful. Instead of doing simple shifting of lists, we can actually start to interrogate other lists. So we have here, by default, Grasshopper has spat out P points as a tree. We've simplified it, so we have a list. Here's my list. We have a list of lists. I'm now going to use a little panel that's really useful when dealing with data trees called tree statistics. You can find this in sets under tree. So if you go to sets and look under tree, these are kind of the most, I think almost all, the elements that you'll need to manipulate trees with. This tree statistics panel, I'm going to insert my points into it. So it asks for a tree, a data tree to analyze, and our points, as you see if I hover over, our points P as a tree. Just going to remove that. All this panel does, this tree statistics, is spit out useful information about the tree in which, you're look, which you've inserted. Those three sets of information are the paths. So you see I've got six locally defined values, six locally defined paths. Remember zero being the first one. So there it goes from naught to five for my six paths. Then I've got the length of each path. So that's kind of the list within the list, right? Which in mine is 14, and that makes sense because my V count 13 is what I've got. And then the final one is the number of paths and branches within the tree. So why does this matter? Imagine you're moving the U and V values or you're moving other parametric values. These values will update accordingly as well. So you don't hard code how many paths you've got. Once I move this, all these values will update. OK. So what I want to do is... I know that my number of paths are six. That will obviously is because my u value here is five. That will change if I move that up to seven. This up to six, that will go to seven. So what I'm going to do is, in the same way we did shift list, I'm going to grab our, these values all the way to here. Kind of like imagine you have your first list here. to be the starting from this point all the way to the end. Does that make sense? Then I can marry up my data. So using this number of paths count, so it's six here, but it could be any number, I'm going to go from basically zero to that minus one, uh, that minus two even, to get this value. Then the second one will be one with that minus one to get that value. 
That, because zero is a number, you've got a minus two to get that value, that index, and minus one to get that index. Okay. So what we can do is we can construct a domain. I hope you've come across those. But that's creating something, a domain of bad values. I need two of these because I'm going to have from here to here and then here to here. So I'm going to copy and paste that. Now in A, the first one, it'll always be zero. I'll always want the zero path going up to the n minus two path. So I can even just hard code that, that value in. No matter what I do to my surface, that will always be zero. So I'm going to use a panel here and type in the number zero and plug that into A. And I could do exactly the same for my next, the other list in A because it's always going to be the first one, not, not the zero one. It's going to be the shift to the first one. Got it? I don't think so. I don't, I just by habit. All with me so far? We're constructing this domain here and then the shifted domain. And then what we're going to do afterwards, after we've done all that, we'll do the old school shift list to get the other dimension there. Okay, so for the zero one, I want my number of paths minus two. So I'm going to use an expression for that within Grasshopper. An expression you just input, it performs the expression and gives you the value output. So if I double type, uh, and type expression. I can double click and what I can put in here is pretty much anything I want with regards to the operators and the functions. And I'm going to do x minus 2. So I double clicked on it, typed x minus 2 and hit OK. I then placed it into my C count, the number of paths. If I were to place a panel on the outside of that, at the moment it's four because of my five, and I can increase that, and I'll see it change. So that's gonna be my other end of my domain here, in the first domain. I'm going to do the same for the other, for 1, but instead of x minus 2, I'm going to do x minus 1 to get that very final value. Great, so we've got a data tree, we found how many paths there are, and we're using that, value, that number to construct two domains so we're able to kind of do that shit list style thing that we're aware of.
If you're uh, having an issue with the expression panel, if you are, okay. Right, I'll just show you another way of doing that. I'll take that out. Um, here, if you hover over B, right click on it, and go into expression, you'll get a little arrow here with an expression editor. If you were to type the same thing, x minus 2, into there, and then plug in C, hopefully you haven't got the same error. So just to repeat what I did there, I right clicked on B, hovered under expression, typed in the expression at x minus 2, x is the default variable used within these inputs nowadays. Ordinarily, I wouldn't actually use this. It was just to be explicit about what was going on. A lot of the time, people will do it in the expression editor. Uh, yeah, so if, if it didn't work for one of the expression panels, it obviously wouldn't work for both. So in here, in B, you would just do x minus 1. Okay, so we've got what we're looking for, hopefully. Let's use a panel just to double check. I'm going to click my panel here, 0 to 7, and 1 to 8. I just double check my, yeah, that makes sense. My U count is at 8. I'm now going to actually grab the branch in which I'm interested, that path. So I'm going to go into sets. Under tree, I'm going to use the panel tree branch. So this is where I'm actually grabbing the branch I'm interested in grabbing. And this takes as an input T, the tree, and then P, the actual path. So I'm going to plug my paths into the domain, and then the T, the tree, is into those original points P. I'm sure you've been made aware, you know that you're dealing with data trees, when you see this dashed line here. I'm going to copy and paste that node and do exactly the same, in, but the P will now go into my other domain. Okay, so I've grabbed the naught to seven and one to eight branches of my tree, halfway there. Once I've done that, so I've grabbed, I've put the data in the set I want to do, we're then going to do the exact same thing uh, that we did previously, which is just do the old school shifting of the list. But every single value in here, we're going to create a shifted version of it to get these points as well. So the final bit, those four, the, the, the third and fourth points are shifting both those lists. So I'm going to use the shift list panel. I'm going to plug it into my branch and I'm going to do the same on the other one. If we 
We've got our tree manipulation correct. Hopefully we've got 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 and 0.4 of our panel. Try and test that. We're going to construct our panel using the four point surface panel, uh, grasshopper panel. Now, the order in which we apply our points is obviously important. We could very easily get a sort of inverse diamond looking thing. So, it might take a bit of trial and error. When you're in the sort of, should we say, debugging phase of parametric design, if you put your parameters at a low value whilst you're, you're playing with it, it means that when you make a mistake, and of course you will, um, you're not waiting for the computer to churn out 10,000 panels. So before I do this, I'm just going to bring down my U count and my V count to something manageable to the computer. And I'm going to try and plug these in. I think this is the order. No, it's not. Oh, well, I've done a massive sublist. Yeah. So the last bit that I've missed out is between our domain and grabbing our tree, we actually need to make that a sublist. So if you double click and type sublist. I'm going to take my paths of my tree as the list and my domain, which is the domain here, and I'm going to use that as my paths. And I'm going to do the same for the other one. So just to reiterate, I'm creating a sublist of these paths, 0 to 4. That's now 1 to 3, 0 to 3. And then the other one, 0 to 4, the sublist is now 1 to 4. So just to reiterate that second bit that I missed out, we need to create, we're using this domain on to, to, to create the domain of paths, not place the domain directly into our uh, data tree branch path. We need to create a domain, a sublist of this path. So what I did was I created a sublist. I inserted that, the paths, the list of paths into here. I got our domain and inserted that into the D, which is asking for the domain of indices, and that gives me a subset of base list. So I can't just plug I straight into here. I have to use this panel. Oh. 
simplify. Uh, I haven't checked. Just the order of the things. I'll just check the order, so it's the first one. Make that a little bigger just to <coughs> Oh the the wrap. Yep, so on the shift list, what we don't want to do is wrap that final value all the way up to the top again. So I just make sure that it's false. And you can see, if I hide my surface, that the order in which you put the points in really matters. I've got the order incorrect here, and it's going one, two, three, four. I need it to be going all the way around. So I just need to change the order in which I put it into my four-point surface. So let's take a look around there. Nope. There we go.
So uh, I'll carry on. Okay, so hopefully you've all got now some straight edge. Kind of doing a sort of an approximate. Right now, we're halfway there. And the sort of next half of this will actually be looking more geometrically in taking that this is our now base surface, we've now got a data tree of square uh, rectilinear surfaces. We're going to use those to create our nodes, and we'll place a sphere there as a representation of that, and then also our, um, our beams. So the things that we kind of outlined at the start was our beams need to be normal to the surface, the underlying surface, and also controlling how long those are, how, I, I, aka how big the node is so we can shorten it to allow the, the node to uh, uh, be placed. Um, so, let's go back to our thing. In a bit of a similar fashion to how we sort of deconstructed the tree using this tree statistics, we're going to use a similar kind of paradigm here. We're going to use deconstruct BREP panel to get I think it's called Deconstruct, yep. And that's to kind of extract some information about our boundary representation, or in this case, surfaces and nerve surface. So if we join those together, what that outputs is the list of faces of that BREP. In this case, it'll be one per surface. A list of edges, and then a list of vertices. Don't forget to save at this point. Um, what we're interested in are the edges. Those are going to be our beams. We're not infilling anything at the moment. We're creating a lattice. So we're interested in that edges output. We're grabbing the edges of our, uh, our surfaces. Remember, we're going a long-winded way around of doing these things, but it's good to get used to data trees and manipulating them. Now, if we were to start interrogating and manipulating and doing things to these edges, so let's say I take this edge here. Does anyone see um, a problem we might have at, the, at this point, let's say at this point? For example, the number of edges. So we're extracting the edge from this surface, and then we're extracting the edge from this surface, the edges from this surface also. So what are we going to have here? Now, exactly, we're going to have duplicates there. So what we can use is a little tool within uh, the Kangaroo tool set that I hope you have called Remove, Remove Duplicate Lines that we're going to perform on all of our uh, panels. <coughs> so let's have a look at our output edges here. If I hover over, uh, I'll even put a panel here for you to have a look at. So when I put a panel, I see that I've got... My first list is a list of four lines, which makes sense. We've made kind of rectilinear shapes, so we've got four lines, that makes sense. Then another list of four, then another list of four. Hopefully, you should only have list of fours there uh, if we've done it correctly. We do have a bizarre structure of our uh, values here. So, again, we're going to use that right click on E and do simplify. If everyone saw what I did there, I right, right clicked on E, and that brings down and cleans up that tree structure. But different to before, we now have 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2, so it's getting more complicated, our data tree structure. As we mentioned, we're going to get duplicates here. And actually, all, we, we've created our setting out. All we want to do is now perform operations individually onto these edges. So we kind of no longer need that data structure. So what kind of operation would we perform to um, reduce that big data structure down to dealing with each individual item? Pattern, yeah. So I'm going to create a new node called line. I'm going, this just basically puts my values into a little variable to um, 
keep my script clean. And I'm going to right click on that. Actually, no, I won't. I'll do it explicitly. I'm going to double click, type flatten tree. And I'm going to import my lines into that. So my data structure has gone from the one above to the one below. So we started with a list of one surface. We constructed this data tree to a very uh, organized manner. And now we're bringing that back down to a flattened list of data. For the sake of continuing, I'm going to right click on my point list and my couple of panels here and unpreview. Just to leave my, I'm going to unpreview my deconstruct, just to leave my panels there. Unpreview all of this. So I'm just leaving those as a visual aid. So now we've flattened, we've got a list of our beams. These are now our beam elements in which we can form our algorithms upon. So let's first of all, for our beam, find its normal, find its orientation. So your surface will be rather complex, and actually the normal might change along the beam. So we need to, let's for the sake of this, let's pick an appropriate point at which we interrogate the normal of the surface. What would be a good point along our beam? Good point, perfect, yeah. So I'm just going to use a little panel here, uh, point on curve, I believe it's called. So this is called point on curve within the curve analysis. We've got a straight line, we've got two points in a straight line. You can probably just use vector maths to find that. Remember, nerves curves using this pan, this here that doesn't necessarily mean the center point. Um, this is the this is the point five along the UV. But with a straight line, it coincidentally happens that it's pretty much center. I'm going to input that into my T. So now I've got a list of center points, and these are the points I'm going to use. on our beam, we need to take that point and we need to associate it. If we want to find the normal on a surface, the UV, we need to kind of input UV parameters. We can't just say, here's a point in world space, give me the normal. We have to input the UV parameters and it will give you the UV back out. So we need to find the closest point on the surface to our point. Does that make sense? Once we've done that, the closest UV parameter then we can use that to, to evaluate the surface as normal. So we can use a panel called surface closest point. You can find that in the surface analysis tool. It takes as inputs a sample point. So this is a point in world coordinates and also a surface. So that S, we need to drag it all the way back to our original surface um, panel. And then the P is obviously our midpoint. So big long line here. And what, what you'll find is now you've got two sets of points. One right directly on our B, and then the closest point on our surface.
So it gives us the point and world coordinates, great, but we're not actually interested in that at this juncture. We're interested in the point within, its U, within the surface's UV domain, which is that second one down. And we can use that bit of data to calculate the normal, and we use the evaluate surface panel to do that. The evaluate surface panel, it, it wants a surface and it wants a UV coordinate, and it'll give you various, it'll spit out various bits of data. I think the point, the normal, which is what we're looking for, and probably the frame, which is, yeah, which is the plane. So, pretty obvious, we're now going to connect our original surface up to this panel, and then in the UV, we're going to import and connect up our new UVs from our closest point. The visualisation that this panel gives you is the actual frame, which is kind of created by the, the, the normal and then the U, uh, UV, the XY. Messy. If you do get something like this, if you ever get something like this with planes, if you go up to here, display, preview plane size, I think I've obviously got a tiny surface here because I've got eight. If I drop that down to like 0 0.5, say, I get a more appropriate, obviously planes are infinite. Um, it's just a visualization of it. We talked for about two minutes about removing the duplicate lines, but we never actually got around to do it. If you do have kangaroo um, connected after you flattened the list, if you use the remove duplicate lines panel and plug that into T, and then plug that into our 0.5 midpoint, you'll see that you've gone from 132, well, in my case, 132 lines down to 76. You've removed those duplicates.
Everyone good? Great, so we've got our orientation that we're interested in doing. Let's actually create our beam. Um, so, the way in which we're going to do it today, there are really many ways you can do it. But what the way in which we're going to do is kind of you know, quite an optimized way. We're going to create our section. So, let's say, for the sake of argument, our beams are square or rectilinear. And then we're going to sweep that along our line along here. So the things that we need to do is align our section, our rectangle, uh, in the correct orientation, then sweep along this vector. Yes. So let's first of all create this square, our actual section. This section can be anything. It can be an I, it could be an I beam, it could be whatever you'd like. But let's say for today, it's like a sort of a, just an oblong. So we need to find this location to place it, and obviously the orientation as well. So we've got the orientation normal to the surface, but we also need the orientation this way. So how can we find the, 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 this vector here? We have two points, exactly, yeah. So that's quite easy to do. How do we find this point? So we can, just, we can just use the grasshopper component to find the start point. So we've got the start point. We can create this uh, geometry. We know the vector of direction. And then we can orientating it, orientate it using the, the normal of which we've just created. So let's create that oblong. Um, it's just a rectangle. Uh, if you were to type rectangle, As an input, it asks for a plane, and then dimensions of the rectangle in the x direction and the y. Interestingly, and quite uniquely, that comes as a sort of domain. But minus, 0 .1, minus 1 here is a default to 1, and then the y minus 1 to 1. So if we were able to input something, it wouldn't be a specific dimension. It would actually be a domain. Um, so it's always good to hover over the inputs and see actually what it's asking for. Because here, minus 1 to 1, you're like, oh, that's not a dimension. Uh, so actually, this actually has a width of 2, as it were. Yep. Um, so, I'll do this plan for now. Let's, um, let's control that parameter, that actual size of our rectangle. So we can do the construct domain panel. And for the x and y, if you want it to be rectangular, you're probably going to need two. Okay. And to be around the center point, you'll need a negative value and then the corresponding positive value, for A and B. So for the construct domain, a will be, say, minus 1, B, what plus 1? Y, the other constructor may, minus 1 plus 1, or whatever the value. Know that they're going to be the same value, just the negative of it. See if it's one slider for both the A and B inputs. So I'm going to do that now. I'm going to take my rectangle, construct domain, put that into my x and put that into my y. And I'm going to create a slider. I'm going to have this between, say, uh, I don't know, 0.2 and 5. I'm going to put that in my plus value and to get the corresponding negative value I can use the negative panel which is in maths operators 
and that just gives me the negative, the corresponding negative value. And I can input that from to my domain end into my A. And then I'm always going to get 0 point there minus 0 0.2 to 0 0.2 minus 0 0.1 to 1.1. 1, 1. So here, this is really the power of automation. We're just going to kind of construct one section and then we're going to apply it to our entire list of uh, beams. And I'm going to do the same for that, that y value as well. So you'll end up with something that looks like this. Geometries, you've kind of compartmentalized the actual design of it, and then the next part of the algorithm, we're going to apply it to our, set, our, our list of beams. So if you need to go back and change your section design, say it becomes an I beam or some form of other, you can just adjust this bit and it's going to be applied to the rest of the geometry. It's the um, it's the section of the beam.
Okay, so now you should have your section design. Uh, it will be by default in the plane of the world coordinates x and y, so it'll be at zero, zero, you should see it. Sometimes that's actually quite nice to have it starting there, because if you're just concentrating on that, you can just go to your origin, redesign it, draw, maybe draw it yourself, and then apply it to your surface. So kind of uh, compartmentalizing that part of it is quite useful sometimes. So let's now orientate that design to our beams. So we need to find the start point and the end point of our beam, and that's to use it. So we place it at our start point, and then we use the start point and end point to get that vector to sweep it along uh, as, as its orientation. So let's go to our points, which is at about this point here where we had the removed duplicates. And if you type end points, you'll get a panel that's in curve analysis. And we can connect that to our duplicate lines. And what that gives us as an output is the start point and the end point of our lines. So let's get that vector between these two points, and we can use construct vector, uh, two-point vector even, two-point uh, vector, is it? Vector two-point. If in doubt, always just go to the vector tab. Under vector, you'll see vector two-point. And I'm going to plug into A and B, the start point and the end point, and that outputs a vector. So I've got all the information I need to orientate my section onto my surface. I just need to construct, I need to input it as a plane into my rectangle here. So I'm going to, which one is it called? It's called the plane. I'm going to use a plane. I'm going to construct a plane using the normal. So plane normal in vector plane. And as my origin, I'm going to use the start point. And as my normal, I'm going to use the vector. And then I'm going to insert that plane into my rectangles planes. So you should get your rectangle design. Origin is at the start point, and its normal is along the vector of the beam. The final thing we need to do to this plane is align it with that normal direction. So we can use the plane align panel. So we're going to take our plane and we use the plane align, which it takes the normal to the surface plus a plane, and that will rotate it around. So if I use align plane, you can find that in the vector plane panel. I'm going to import, insert my plane and then the normal vector that we calculated into the direction. Once I've got that plane, I'm going to import that into my rectangle. 
I'm going to hide some of this stuff. And now you'll see a slightly different array of rectangles where they rotate to align to that normal to the surface.
not much left, just a sweet bit. just replace this this rectangle at this point with any other form of design, IB, box section. So that is now compartmentalized. We just insert the plane in which we want to do. This is now reorientated plane into whatever we have here, whatever geometry, and it'll update immediately. So we know we can probably put a group around this. That's what that is. Now let's do the actual geometric. Let's sweep that rectangle along that rail. So we're going to use the sweep one tool, which is just sweeping along one rail. A bit like the loft function we did at the start, sweep is another way of generating geometry from, cur from nerves curves. So it uses the sweep one panel, which is in surface freeform. So what do we think R, the rails, will be? R1. Yep, yep, perfect, yep. So Oops. Ah, so I need to graft it. No? Yes. So we have an issue here, and this is the final bit of data tree manipulation. We can't give this panel a load of curves and a load of sections. We need to give it our rail and a section to perform it. So we've got loads of rails and loads of sections. What can we do? Give it one element at a time. Oh yeah, so we've got a list of lines, and we've got a list of our rectangle sections, but it can't, it doesn't take as an input all of them at once. One rail and one section curve at a time. Call the function, do it again. So how do we take our big long list, our two big long lists, and put them into a data tree structure that allows it to be able to perform one function at a time? graph them. So what that does is it's going to put each element into a list of one. So we're going to get a, a lot of lists of one element. So, uh, yes, 
I've got my sweep one. And here I've got my lines. And here I've got my section curves. And they're both in big, fat, long lists. Right-click, simplify that. I'm going to use the graft panel. And if I put this into my lines and then show you the resulting list, can you see now what's going to happen is instead of the sweep one doing it on every single one at once, bang, 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 and it's not how the algorithm works, it's going to perform it on this line, then it's going to perform the same function again on this line, then it's going to perform the same function again on this line, independently. And for data matching, we've got to make sure that we've got exactly the same with our section curves. So I'm going to graft our section curves as well. So our lists have gone from on the left that what you see above and below to what we've got on the right there. Let's see if it complains to me again. No, it doesn't. It performs the function each time. Now, I've got massive rectangular sections here. So I'm just going to re-evaluate how I'm doing those. Turn off my independent services. So hopefully once you've performed that sweep, we've taken two flat lists, grafted them both, which is what this algorithm requires, because it needs to perform it on one rail and one section curve at a time, and then perform the algorithm again on one rail and one section curve. Now it's starting to look like a lattice of straight beam elements orientated according to our surface, normal to our surface. Parametric elements is in, but and it's structured really nicely. So when I give you the task, at the node, could you please place a sphere and parametrically control its radius, you'll be able to do that. the nodes, think about the fact that you want, might want to parametrically control the radius of that sphere.
few more minutes for the node, and then. Lot of spheres. Imagine it'd be big as well. Okay. So final bit. What's this sphere called? Mesh sphere. No, I'll just use sphere. So. I'm going to use the sphere pan, uh, panel, grasshopper panel, which is sur a primitive surface in the tab surface. This asks for a base plane and a sphere radius. Now, what has everyone put in base plane? The what? You put the endpoints. Okay, great. Grasshopper is written as such that it will not complain when you do that. It's asking for a plane, and you're giving it a point, so technically, it's not quite right. What it does is it has defaults, so if you give it a point, the, the, it'll make the default plane the world x, y. Now, in the sphere, you won't notice that, because it's all, you could twist the sphere however you want. But if you were to give it a point, it'll do the default, which is the world x, y plane, and you might see it flip. So if you're being quite proper, when it asks for a plane, it makes sure you get that right. But because of the nature of grass, which we're user friendly, if you input that point with a sphere that won't matter because when it twists, it'll work just as good. So I think the gentleman there said endpoint, that's, that's good. Plug that in. Bang, I've got some mega nodes. It asks for a radius, so I'm going to give it a radius. That's a ridiculously small radius now. good homework for you guys to try and attempt. So once I've got that, If you just look at my screen, the parametric nature of it means that when I do this, my grasshopper definition is updating automatically. So I can move anything around. I can even instantiate a new, totally new surface. And that you'll see that red is updating. So with regards to data trees, 
let's just review what we did. We took a flat list of one surface. We subdivided that surface into UV points, creating a data tree of two dimensions. We manipulated that to create a two-dimensional array of flat surfaces. We then flattened that list to manipulate the edges of those surfaces. We then, right at the end, re-grafted that to put it back into a data tree to sweep uh, those rectangles to create our beams. So if you've got a good handle on manipulating data, I mean, this is a very long-winded way of doing something. You know, it's a lot quicker ways, but if you're able to you know, break the back of manipulating data of Grasshopper, it really unravels lots of opportunities with regards to doing things. Any last questions at all? To your experts. <laughs>